Okay, I don't I don't want to reveal too much of the story because I would love people to to buy the book. But if but I think it's important maybe to uh, provide at least some a uh, little bit of uh, of information about the arc of the novel. I mean, it, it begins in uh, Castellano, right? Um, yes. And um, it, and there's there's a kind of um, labor um, war going on. It's not even a, a, a dispute that involves this character Cassiopeia at the beginning. Um, there, there's, there's the nobility, and then there's, of course, the, um, um, the, the, uh, um, the fasci, and who are in, in, in terrible conflict with each other. And that um, is sort of the political background of the book. But there's also a very strong individual story about a woman named Mariana, who is in love with this uh, fellow named Niccolo. And he and his brother um, play important roles in the book, and eventually, um, uh, the main character, Santo, Regina ends up, uh, who's the father of uh, Mariana, ends up traveling to, to New York. Um, I don't know how much you want to reveal at this point, but I think it's important just to talk a little bit about the, the arc of the story, but in both political terms, because it was so violent and intense in many ways, as well as familial and, um, and simply um, human. I mean, there's some, as I said a minute ago, it's a very mythopoetic book because you capture so much of the characters in a kind of mythopoetic, they're larger than life. And uh, in, even though they're um, uh, Italian characters, uh, I think everybody can identify with this very strong uh, human quality in, 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 in all of their undertakings. And well, the book, the way I look at the book is it has an outer frame and an inner frame. And the outer frame is Santo's story as just sort of an ordinary but idealistic immigrant who goes to America and has these experiences and gets caught in between two major historical characters. One, Joe Petrosino, who's a head of the Italian squad who was hired to root out uh, black hand gangsters. And the other is Vito Cascio Ferro, who is Petrosino's arch rival. Uh, Santo gets caught up with both of them. And meanwhile, he has a personal problem, which is his precocious daughter, who is uh, basically seduced and abandoned. And she takes revenge and uh, on her on her lover, and so Santo is actually ends up with a, sort of a family problem and a political problem. But in the course of this, uh, in the course of San Santo's travels, he travels to the American South. He works in a uh, plantation um, as a as a migrant worker, and there he experiences the same troubles that he had in Sicily, where the workers are exploited, and. So I also tried to take, take, make, a, make a picture of the United States at that time in 1901, uh, 1907 when it takes place, which was a year when it was the height of Italian immigration. A quarter of a million Italians came to America that year. Hmm. And so I sort of took advantage of that. And Santo actually spent some of his time in New York, some of his time in Sicily, some of his time in the South. Uh, I got that from research. I New Orleans specifically. Pardon? New Orleans. Yeah, he spent some time in New Orleans. And um, New Orleans, which, by the way, was the uh, place that Italians Im immigrated to before they went to New York. New, New Orleans had an old established Sicilian community there with its own history, um, which is touched on in the novel. But then Santo goes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's where he meets Cascio Ferro. Well, he met Cascio Ferro in the first pages of the book at the, at the demonstration, at the peasant demonstration. And then right. they meet later, and yeah. it's in, it's in and it's in uh, New Orleans where Petrosino catches up with Cascio Ferro, and meets him later in New York. Right. Yeah, and that's how the. So I had to juggle the two plots, and what I tried to do is make sure that no matter what I wrote, no matter what chapter I wrote, I referred to or had reference to the other side, to the outer frame as well as the inner frame. So that's why I think I was able to keep the story going. Right. Um, you know, I, I think it, this may be a, a good time for you to read a couple of paragraphs that um, just uh, reveal the, the quality of your writing as well as the character development. I, I have a, f a few that I've chosen, but you may want to start with one yourself uh, and sort of set okay, it up. Okay, I, ha I have a bunch. I have a few things. Uh, why don't I try... Um, one thing I'd like to try was when you talked about myth and mythopoetic. Um, mm -hmm. There's a scene where Santo, who realizes that his daughter has been compromised uh and the real thing to do is to you know shoot the guy um but he's That's not he's really, that, but he's really sort of he's sort of a hamlet 
he's sort of a Hamlet and he doesn't really want to be like everyone else. So this is a passage where it, it kind of explains why. He's, he's, waiting, he's waiting for Niccolo to show up on the road. So I'll skip that part. So he's when waiting. About, when you say he, Vince, you're me. Santo, you're me. Santo is waiting for Niccolo Santo. to show up and he has a pistol, but he doesn't really, he doesn't know what to do. Yeah, okay. So here he is. And Santo is Mariana's father. Just yeah, to remind Mariana's father. So here he is. Enveloped in a heavy floral smell, he heard the flicker of birds and the distant rush of water. He wasn't sure what he would do if he saw Niccolo. It wasn't a simple matter of putting an end to a young man's life, of violating this momentarily blessed silence with the firing of a weapon. His solution to this problem would come out of his past. It would come from his character. And there was a childhood incident by which he defined himself while waiting for Niccolo to come along. And while waiting for Niccolo to come along, he thought about it. There'd been a Castellanese named Vincenzo who spent his life on a fishing boat out of Trapani and had come home to retire. He was an old man burnt by the sun with lined leather, leathery skin, and every day he sat with the other old men in the piazza. Vincenzo was a man of regularity. He arrived at the same time every evening, smoked the same number of cigarettes, and carried a raw egg in his jacket pocket. At exactly five o'clock by the church bell, he poked a hole in each end of the egg with the point of his knife and sucked it dry with a quick motion of egg to mouth. Then he returned the shell to his pocket. One day he didn't eat the egg, but none of the other men seemed to notice. As the light faded, the men started for home, walking with the unsteadiness of old age down the narrow streets that fell off from the piazza. The next morning, Vincenzo was still there, eyes and mouth open, as if amazed that the next breath hadn't come. Men said later that Gan Giuseppe, a local monk unfairly denied sainthood, had been seen on the evening of the old man's death. This monk was said to walk the streets of Castellano when all were sleeping. He was chiefly noted for his visits to those about to die. Any witness pure of soul would be able to see him with the hood of his cowl removed if the deceased were going to heaven. But if the object of the monk's visit was going to hell, the hood would cover his face. It was said that the last man to leave the piazza that night walked past the repose Vincenzo and caught a glimpse of Gan Giuseppe's homespun fluttering near the old man's body. This witness may have heard the monk's famous exhortation uttered near the person about to die. Oh, what an odor of paradise. The witness hadn't seen whether the monk's hood was up or down. Thus, it was never decided whether Vincenzo had gone to heaven or hell. The witness was Santo's father, Franco, a man with a bitter sense of humor. He was the only man in the piazza who didn't habitually dress like a mourner. And uh, just later on, uh, this so his father was the only one who saw the monk. Uh, Santo later saw that his father enjoyed his power of testimony because he was interviewed about whether he saw the monk. His father never changed the basic story, but would color it one way or the other, either to keep the arg argument going or to aggravate the priest, who, this priest who wanted uh, to sanctify, who would, wanted to sanctify the monk. His father would say, "Yes, I saw something the color of a chestnut. Of course, it could have been anything, but there was a flow to it, a definite flow, and perhaps a holy aspect." Santa learned much later that his father's vision had been more incredible than he cared to reveal. Franco had seen Gan Giuseppe, but not at the base of the statue. When he awoke from his sleep and started home, passing the sleeping fisherman, he looked into the purple hazy distance and saw the monk hovering in vaporous space, suspended just above eye level, as distinct in detail as the statue of Gan Giuseppe carried on feast day. For a split second, Franco thought it was the actual statue in defiance of gravity, since the monk's habit hung as if the statue from the nearby church had floated into the air. But then he saw that the monk's face was human with that cadaverous texture created by the suffocating rectory. The monk floated in a vague steamy mist, emitting a noise like a hummingbird or a giant wasp, a suspiration as if wings were beating and embedded in that noise in which the monk's lips moved in rough approximation was the prophetic utter utterance, oh, what an odor of paradise, 
like a voice from underwater. Yeah, that is uh, one of them. One of the superstitions that I read about them. Sicil Sicily is full of superstitions. Yeah, they say it's a land of myth. Sticks out in the middle. Sticks out into the Mediterranean. Had uh, just like Italy, like a so that uh, any number of influences come come to Sicily. Yeah. So that's just magical, Vince. It's just and it's just such beautiful writing too. I must say, it's just it's it's so spare and resonant and um, um, uh, um, so, um, memorable as as uh, as an incident and as as you say, um, a superstition that is is more than superstition. It seems it's really a, a powerful kind of myth that 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 guides the the people's sensibility and. Um, and, and view of life. So on the one hand, you, you have all of this very visceral stuff going on. That, that, you know, the, there are killings in the book. Uh, there's this kind of desperate need to emigrate to America and all of the hardship that goes along with that on those steamships and then you know, settling in both New Orleans and, um, and, and New York. Um, and, yet, and, then, and yet there's this, um, uh, kind of mythical life that that these people live that, that that guides them. So this just this combination of of of, of survival and of of kind of, of belief that undergirds the story in a way that carries it uh, to to the end. Um, did, were you aware of how sort of deeply you were getting into not just the history of immigration, but also the 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 religious and uh, Kind of mythical lives of your character? Not when I started. It's only when I began reading, reading about these things. But also, they somehow they seem natural to me. Um, I, as like I say, I grew up in a in a house where my, especially my Sicilian grandma was a very superstitious person. Uh, she had all kinds of some of the remedies uh, mentioned in the book. Uh, she didn't have, but they were very superstitious. They had this thing called the evil eye. They thought some people had the evil eye. We all know about the evil eye. Yeah. They had, um, and actually, if I had gone more about more uh, read more about the Franco scene of his father, his people began to ascribe certain powers to him because he had seen the monk, which were all were all false, but he played up to it. And um, no, I just tried. Basically, I tried to create a picture of that world, and I tried to make that make sure that that the hard part is getting inside characters inside and not just describing something, but trying to make it relevant to what's happening to people. And my favorite passages are what happens when their first impressions of the United States of America. I could read that, especially Mariana or uh, uh, Santo when he comes to New York and what he sees. Sure, I mean, um, yeah, try to read a paragraph or two of that because I also yeah. want to re reserve time for Petrosino, which is so important. Oh, okay, yeah, I have, a, I have a reading a bit about him, but okay, let me just get this. Um, when Santo comes to New York City, after he made one trip to the United States as a migrant worker, then he came back, got in this trouble, and then he came to New York again. So what Santo, he's, now he's arriving in New York. What Santo had seen in New, York, New Orleans was a trickle. This was a deluge, not only from Italy, but from the Northern European countries as well. It seemed as if one side of the earth had tipped into the other. These were weary men and women, pale, sick, proud, sitting on benches with puzzled looks on their faces, some of them crying and laughing in the arms of already settled relatives. Some had their belongings in valises, baskets, pillowcases, in bags shown from, st sewn from fishnet. Here was a woman with pots and pans on a rope around her neck. There a group of Italians dancing and singing to accordion and mandolin. Santo made his way to the elevated train station at South Ferry and took the train to the Fulton Street Market, which was a fish market. But from there, he planned to walk to his sister's house. The elevated train seemed to fly, but not smoothly. It was a rocking steel car screeching on steel tracks and old timbers, and the thought of the whole structure collapsing into the crowded streets below gave rise to a feeling of danger, but also discovery. This was what America would be like. He could see clear across the boat-filled harbor to bodies of land east and west, whether mainland or islands, he couldn't tell. The land across the water was partly forested. From what he had already knew, there was room enough for people to make this flood he'd seen at Ellis Island appear as a drop. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm, I'll cut, I quit that one, but I have another reading but about Mariana, which I'd also like to read about her arrival and her, what happens to her. Okay. Um, and this is early in the book. This is more or less, um, this is, she, she arrives in, um, and lives with her aunt because uh, she doesn't want to live with her, with her father because her father could be in trouble because of the, uh, the killing, but he, he was accused of. Elizabeth Street was a crowded world of vendors' carts and uncontrolled children. Everyone seemed to be yelling. Pedestrians choked the sidewalk and spilled into the street where they obstructed the traffic. Horse-drawn wagons were packed with peppers and eggplants and artichokes, giant apples and oranges, hanging goats and lambs, cages of chicken and squab, gobs of eel and squid. The food was grown on nearby truck farms or fish from the ocean beyond the great harbor. There were household items too, new and used, clothing, pots, pans, utensils, utensils, all hawked by men who seemed angry that people didn't buy their goods. Indicating the vendors, Angelina, she's the aunt, Angelina said, some are Jews, some are Italians. The Jews are more honest, but by this much only. She squeezed the tip of one thumb, showing only the end of a red painted nail. She spoke while steering Mariana around piles of manure and discarded produce, the last picked through by foraging chickens and beggars, some of the latter pointed out by An Angelina as being rich men. Um, in the press of people, Mariana locked arms with the ant for protection as they passed among buildings partly effaced by the brimming overflow of their contents. People on the steps fanning themselves, hanging over roof, roof stops, rooftops, standing in doorways, sitting in windows as if the last place they wanted to be was inside. There was a tremendous din, a crowd noise that struck like a second wave when they turned onto Canal Street and an even stronger smell of food and sewage. People called from the windows and rooftops. Peddlers held up their goods and screamed angrily, angrily at passersby. They beat on their pots. They waved their dry goods like flags. Chickens and children percolated through all this confusion. So this is the new world that she comes to, quite different from, from the quiet, quiet but also violent place that she comes to, that she left, that she left. Yeah. And there she grows up and becomes, um, so let's say, hardened to life. Right. So I, I don't think we're revealing too much if we say that Mariana had, had to uh, flee uh, Sicily because of something that happened between her and her lover. And then her father uh, becomes involved in this whole scenario as well uh, because he's actually suspected of a crime that involves uh, the lover. I'm just, it's just also curious and intriguing to read um, the, about the suspicion that grows up around innocent people in, in, in the novel, and, but who are essentially treated as, as guilty before they're even uh, convicted. And this plays into Petrosino's um, deal that he makes eventually with Stanto about having, you know, in, with, with, which involves him going back to Italy to, to settle the score with uh, somebody there instead of actually going to prison on false charges. Um, and, 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 and so it's just, it really is a powerful book about how easily a person can, can find himself or herself, uh, mainly himself in your novel, in just deep trouble without, you know, it just reminds me a little bit of Kafka in a way, you know? Um, yeah, was, you can be, it's a funny people have an impression of you that's not really what you are, but that's at, what at all. you can take yeah. over. Yeah, but Petrosino does eventually catch up. Does eventually catch up with with uh, Santo, and he invites him. I I don't know if you want to read anymore. He invites him to his apartment and it's kind of brags yeah. about. No, so that's. I think that's that's near the end, and um, it's kind of near I, the end. I think it would be I, again worth worth reading because it really captures that conflict I was just talking about, and and not just conflict, but that just that um, uh, conundrum that people would uh, found themselves in 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 this. Uh, uh, in their in their constant sort of transit back and forth between Italy and America, and the suspicions that would grow up around them, and uh, that would often just end up in, in deadly ways. And it's it's in that, that way, in that respect, it's a, it's a scary book. You know, it's a very scary book. Well, I could start with a dinner with where Petrosino invites Santo to dinner, where yeah. he and he uh, deal. he know he knows that Santo has. Yeah. supposedly killed another man in Sicily. So he thinks he has 
the yeah. edge over him. But this the is the, in Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they're at they're at this um, meal, and this before, is a picture of Petrosina. Before you before you read this, uh, uh, Vince, we should just mention that Petrosina was a, a real character. Oh, he's a real character. He's a real character, and actually, DiCaprio is making a movie about him right now. Supposedly, wow. supposedly yes, supposedly yes, supposedly yes. And, and you're going to you're going to DiCaprio. <laughs> but anyway, this is a this is a picture of Petrosino. He started out actually working for the sanitation department. Then he became a detective, and he became the Italian expert. And yeah. then he yeah. he he developed what was called the Italian Squad, which was a group of detectives who spoke all the Southern Italian dialects. I mean, he was a, he he was a good and evil person. He did quite a bit of good for Italians, who were Italians were mostly the victims of the Black Hand. Black Hand made their money by intimidating Ita uh, poor Italians who knew who they were from the old world. They the knew Black who they Black were. Black the Black Hand or the precursor of the mafia. Yeah. So okay. let me just yeah. read. Yeah. So Petrosino is talking to Santo at a dinner where he invites him to dinner. During the meal, Petrosino told stories about his police work, but these were never rendered to completion. Either the arrival of something else to eat or a similarity between one story and the next would cause him to jump from one adventure to the other. Petrosino looked at Santo intently when he switched narratives as if testing the younger man's memory. According to him, Italian criminals had created the expressions black hand, mafia, and camorra. These were terms of convenience with no palpable function except to frighten victims. You won't believe how ruthless these men have been, he said, enumerating how he had personally solved many crimes committed by individuals and gang members. Some of these successes took place before the famous Italian squad existed, when Petrosino worked alone, often ridiculed as the quote unquote Italian expert. Petrosino showed Santo a scrapbook of photographs and newspaper clippings. This was a record of his police career from patrolman to detective. Banner headlines and photo collages told of his victories. For example, how he'd imported Big Hen Hen Enrico Big Henry Alfano a leader of the Neapolitan Camorra, deported Henry, uh, sorry, deported him. Petrosino had arranged for reporters to be on hand when he made the arrest. Elaborating on each story, stressing how the newspapers were inaccurate and never willing to give him his due, Petrosino described his capture of the insurance gang, a group that sold life insurance to fellow Italians with one stipulation. In exchange for their low rates, one of the gang was always named as beneficiary. When this was done, they would murder the insured and collect the money. There were numerous individuals arrested and deported, thieves, extortionists, murderers, men whose victims were almost always Italians. Petrosino stressed that he solved these crimes because he was a student of Southern Italian psychology. The detective wasn't modest about his achievements. He'd been pro promoted from patrolman to detective by Theodore Roosevelt, now president, but then police commissioner. How many Italians do you know who can use the telephone to speak to the president of the United States. This subject led him to discuss anarchism among Italian immigrants. Most of the anarchists were in Patterson, New Jersey, a community, a community the detective claimed to have penetrated by disguising himself as a peddler. He told Santo how he'd warned both presidents McKinley and Roosevelt of anarchist plots to assassinate them. But McKinley didn't listen. Why? Because he underestimated my ability. Because McKinley was assassinated, as you know. I mean, just quickly, I'll 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 want to just say one thing. Where why read one part, which I really love, which is why Petrosino is getting Santo to help him. Detective, the detective held out his palms as if no human being could offer more. He's making Santo an offer. Let me express myself in another way. He said, "Any number of men are willing and perhaps able to do the job I ask of you." But if I were to dream of the ideal man, it would be you. And here is why. Among the quarter million Italians being dumped into the city by their government every year, there are too many for a man like myself to help. All these men have the, the Italian mentality. They live life with two schemes. The first lies on the surface. It is the man's public plan for living, that he will work a certain job, live in a certain place, behave in a certain way. But there is a second scheme the private one, a man's insurance against the blows of life. These are the little thieveries, the uses of influence, the lies, the measure of dishonesty by which he greases the wheels. It isn't so difficult discover, to discover this part of any man. I believe you are a man without this second scheme. 
You go through life believing other men will pay homage to your quality, that you don't need to lower yourself to immorality. This is why you went to the butcher shop uh, that had prior, prior. You thought to intimidate Carmelo with the force of truth. And in fact, you did. Okay, I'll, I'll quit there, but it, this is why Petra see, this is actually my, uh, my uh, take on uh, Santo as a character. Yeah. This is why uh, back there when he said he didn't want to kill Nicole, he, he feels that he's too special to do what other people would do and that somehow he will find a way to do things that, that don't offend him so much. Because mm -hmm. he doesn't have that second scheme. <coughs> okay, we just said Nicola was Mariana's boyfriend. We won't say what she happened doesn't... to him at all. But also, I just, just uh, want to make sure we're going to save some time at 5.40 for question okay. and answers. But this interface between familial and like personal life in the, in, the, in, the, in the novel throughout, between Anto and Mariana, of course, he doesn't have a wife. He's a widow, a widower. At Franco, his son as well. Um, and, you know, and, and their uh, social and, and political life. Uh, as if the two was, you know, inextric and they are inextricably uh, c connected, uh, politics with, with, the, with the personal, um, as well as in, in the workplace, the, uh, you know, the conflict between the old feudal system of the nobility and the, and the fasci trying to revolutionize uh, work conditions in uh, Sicily. So this is all tied up together so beautifully and complex, and so with such complexity. Um, I think you just, you just, your passage you just read bet betrays that. Um, so I, I hope people have gotten enough of an idea of, of, of how intricate this, this novel is and, and how powerful uh, the writing. I, you know, I actually have to admit, had to read several passages over again to understand all of the, the nuances, um, which, uh, which uh, really, were really so often poetic and, and, and nuanced. Um, so uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if we should uh, imply what happens here at the end, uh, Vince. I don't know if you want to say anything more about, but I'll just, I'll just say that in addition to this conflict between or this deal that Petrosino makes with um, Santo, th there's the story of Mariana and her father, uh, Santo, uh, that runs throughout this, uh, this whole saga, and which is, is deeply moving how to, find some reconciliation between the two. Uh, Santo wants nothing more than to reconcile with his daughter over what had happened back in uh, Castellano. And I won't ruin what happens, but it, it's so, so well handled. I just have to really have to uh, compliment you on how adeptly and smartly you handle that. Um, well, thank you. It is a novel of, it is a novel of uh, forgiveness is one theme in the, in the novel, is forgiving, yeah. forgiving people for, and understanding each other is Forgi forgiving what seem like the most unforgivable um, uh, crimes or offenses. Uh, uh, but but uh, I, 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 and, and, and forgiveness is almost, I should say, too simple a resolution in some, some of the cases or the main case um, between father and daughter. Let's turn to some of these questions. Uh, people have been writing in here, Vince. Would you like to hear some? Oh, oh yes. Okay. Um, here's a question from, I think, someone you know named Arthur Vogelsang. Vincent, Arthur here. Which modern writer do you wish you had known and personally, uh, per, uh, known well personally and been friends with and why? Well, uh... That's a hard question. Um, there were so many, so many modern writers that I really uh, admire and whose books I took inspiration from. Off the top of my head, I think I would like to know Thomas Berger, who wrote a book called uh, Little Big Man, which was a kind of a, one of those novels that is, does have the kind of historical sweep that I that I really admire. It's if you remember the plot of Little Big Man, it's about a little boy who gets kidnapped by the Cheyenne Indians and yeah. it ends up Good in movie. the battle of the, yeah yeah and ends up in the battle of the Little Bighorn. So it uses General Custer as one of the main characters in the book, and it's it's just I love the book because of its use of history, and mm -hmm. it's it's it actually is a there's a Huck Finn voice to the book that you feel like you're really reading an American novel, and you are. But um, I love the book. Actually, when I first read it, 
it was a long time ago, I read it to the end and I could not believe how, I couldn't figure out how he did it. Mm -hmm. And so I read the book again, I read the book twice. And then I finally looked around and I saw in a library of history of the Cheyenne Indians. And there it was, he'd used all mm -hmm. the names, he had all the history. Yeah, right up your that alley. It. I love that book and I love the writing. I should say to the I point, you made a pilgrimage to Little Bighorn. What? But I should say so much so that you made a pilgrimage to Little Bighorn. Oh yes, I, I did go to the I did go to the Little Bighorn. I did go to see the scene of the battle. I know yeah. I couldn't resist. I wondered why you did that. Uh, <laughs> so here's here's another one uh, from Kathy Curto. Did you ever hear hit a dry spell in terms of productivity, creativity? while writing this particular book? If so, can you talk about that and speak to whether the characters helped you out of it? I, I think uh, that can happen if we're open to it. Yes, I know about the evil eye too. <laughs> well, this book sat around for years. I mean, I wrote a little bit and I worked on it. Then I set it aside. I tried to get an agent. I got discouraged. I put it aside again. Um, then I worked on it again and I constantly tried to make it better. I think, I think when it first started out, it was pretty spare and basic. And as I wrote and began to write more, I, I tried to get, I tried to be a better writer all the time. Mainly I tried to get inside, inside the characters instead of just describing them. But no, this book sat, sat around for a long time. I also think that when you feel that people feel writer, writers feel that they, they're empty or they have nothing to do, it's really because they're thinking about it. You know, you need to, things need to in, incubate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just, it, just because you're not writing doesn't mean you're not thinking about what you're going to do. Mario mm -hmm. Puzo has part of that in his uh, journals, which are in a book called The Godfather Papers, where he said that um, he calls it serious internal preparation. That mm -hmm. when you're not writing something and you feel bad, it's because you're just internally preparing because still you think every minute of the day you think of what you want to write and how you're going to write it, but you just haven't done it. But it just means that you're preparing yourself for it. So I kind of, I kind of don't believe in what they call writer's block or things like that. I think you just, you should give yourself time and there's a time for it. So back to Arthur's question, I'm going to have another one here too from, from Judith Vogelsang, but uh, you, you often mentioned how much you love Philip Roth's writing and his style. I, 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 I sense an influence there of, of him in your writing. There's such a kind of powerful spare writing in your, um, uh, in your language. Would you um, agree with that? I don't know, influences, influences come from so many places. Roth, I certainly admire his intensity and his energy. Um, um, I don't know, I really can't say if I sound like Philip Roth, some people say I found, sound like Raymond Chandler. I, I don't know, you, you, you sound like yourself. As you write, you, you develop your own voice and you learn how, you, you, you become your own, really. I mean, there are, a, as much as I love Philip Roth, I mean, there are other writers I love also yeah, terrific. Well, I didn't, I didn't mean only Philip Roth, but there's just, yeah. a, there's just a really well, Roth, clean, Roth is, I, style. No, Roth is, these, these writers are really kind of with you when you write. I mean, yeah, uh, right, right. They stick with you. So Judith, Judith uh, Vogelsang wants to know, um, how long have you been writing this book? And how does this length of time compare to your other books? This book took me longer than any other book that I wrote because I let it sit for years and I picked it up and I put it down and I worked on it and I made it a little better and I tried to get an agent and I couldn't get an agent and I got discouraged and I set it down and I set it down again. Mm -hmm. And that was it, I would say 20 years. How about that? Um, okay. 20 years, of off, 20 years off and on, getting discouraged, going on to something else. I think my, I've written a bunch of no I've written, I don't know, six or eight novels. Most of them haven't been published. My Julius Caesar novel, which is a short novel, almost a really long novella. It took me two years to write, spent hours and hours in the library reading, reading about that. And that came pretty quickly. My right. short story book came okay. That was okay. I mean, they kind of stories that had to be written. Um, no, this book took a long time. Because I, it, was, it was very rich and I had, I didn't want to gamble away that material in there. I wanted to new, make the use the best of it. I knew I had very rich material and I wanted to do the best job I could with it. Mm -hmm. I, I think your readers might be interested in knowing that you write in a little sort of cabin next to your 
<laughs> I spend a good eight to ten hours a day in there. Oh well, working away. Um, the writing here's room. <laughs> here's, in fact, you're in it right now. Um, here's a question from Cassandra McBride. She says, "If there's time, uh, if there is time from an English teacher who is watching, what is the importance of the lives and superstitions and struggles of these people for you? What is it about creating these characters that resonates for you as an author in 21st century America? What do we learn about the world we live in from what you write? Is it?" about ex excavating our origins, or is there something that transcends time and place that draws you to these people and places? Well, that's a, that says it better than I can say it. I mean, um, the, the, main, the main energy for writing this book has always been that I didn't know who these people were, who my, who my, what my family, I knew they were from this part of the world. And the more I read about this part of the world, the more I realized how rich it rich is, whether I read from Herodotus or Homer, uh, and especially Sicily, which is you know laden with laden with myth. You know, Odysseus apparently, you know, found the Cyclops here uh, in in uh, in Sicily. No, the the main thing is that to pre the main thing why, the main reason why you write is to preserve something so yeah. it doesn't go away. You don't want this history to die. You want it to, and the best way to deliver it is if you can deliver it in a story that makes sense to people, then you could deliver that culture. Mm -hmm. You back for that, that picture it. of America in 19, in 1907. That picture of Italians working in the South alongside the blacks and the politics of that. Mm -hmm. You want to preserve that. Yeah, absolutely. That's the motivation. Is you really to preserve something? You don't want it to die because it's it's on your mind all the time. You've actually mentioned to me that Homer is one of your biggest influences. Uh, I think, I think I did mention it in this sense. Um, the very, I, I told you before that I. Around the corner, I, I used to be able to walk to my school, my, gra my grade school was around the corner from my house. The first first place I passed was the, the Orchid Room, the mob joint. Next was the uh, New York Public Library, branch, library branch. And I remember going in there when I was about, oh, I don't know, about eight or nine or 10, maybe 10. And I just by serendipity picked off, picked up a child's copy of the Trojan War. And I stood there and read it standing up. And I almost started crying. And then I actually read it again. The Iliad and that was the beginning. Beginning. Yeah, it was the Iliad, and that was, and then it ended with the, the famous line from Homer, which this was the funeral of Hector, tamer of horses, and I never forgot that, and I never lost, and I, and and later on when I began to read and I read a lot of pulp fiction, a lot of pulp history, and a lot of mm -hmm. war and all these kind of things that young men are, young men like, I never lost. I don't think that I ever lost that epic voice. Yeah. The, the, That's the, why I, the, the storyteller that you see in Con, you see in Conrad or you see in the great storytellers. It's a, I don't know. I think I still have it. I think I think I have that voice, yeah, or I, I think I I don't know. Do. Um, it's an epic voice. I call it an epic voice. Yeah. People want to know where to get this book, and it's not out yet. Uh, so I, we yeah. should just mention that it's going to be in all the bookstores here in Brattleboro, where everyone's books, as well as Antidote books in the fall and October. I guess it's coming out. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, here's another um, comment, um, uh, just a comment uh, by David Rohn. There are powerful women in the book with distinctive personalities. And dot, 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 ellipsis there. So, <laughs> Well, uh, Mariana is, yeah. I Mariana, well, there, she's not the only one. Book almost twice, I can testify to that, yes. Um, so maybe that leads to the next question. I'll, there are a few others here. Um, how how did you capture these women's voices so powerfully and accurately? I don't know. I mean, you just you you like I say, I use the word inhabit. You learn to inhabit a character, and then you become the character. I mean, I'm in everyone. I'm like all right, all writers. You know, you're inside every one of your characters. Yeah. And sometimes you think, sometimes you sort of channel people you know, but not really and truly. You might channel their faces, you, you might channel their- you get these their women so but accurately from Vicenza to Mariana to Angelino. I mean, they, 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 I mean no, no one would question their, 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 you know, their feminine voice. Well, they're, I don't know, they're, they, they start out, they, characters often start out as stereotypes and then you, if you do a good job, they kind of transcend that. So you could reduce every one of the characters in this book probably to a stereotype. But yeah. then I, what I tried to do is get a little bit beyond that and make them more of a full character. But they're yeah. all, 
they're all basic types. I mean, wow. there are people that I heard the voices, the, the rhythms and their language and the rhythm yeah. of their language, the thing that I grew up with, that I heard that. I mean, a lot of writing is your ear is what you hear. You, you actually talk about the importance of dialect throughout the, the book and in and, and recognizing someone's, where they're from, what they believe in, their mythology, just through their dialect. Dialects are important in Italy because Italy is a provincial country which was only unified in 1865. And Mussolini, when Mussolini came to power, he tried to get rid of the dialects uh -huh. and, and standardize the language and people he got, you know, people reacted against it. But he, dialects are very interesting in the, in the Italian culture. People, people and they're very forget, different. People forget, one place from one. people forget that Italy was really two countries. It was uh, Sicily, in the uh, Neapolitan area in northern Italy, and then Garibaldi yeah. unified Italy, what, in 1865? And around 1865, Garibaldi unified the country. Yeah. It, was at three, it was actually three countries. There was the Vatican, was one country, yeah. which well, is still a country. country. <laughs> that's right. Then there was Italy itself, Italy itself, which was north of Rome. Then there was, the, then from south, from, from Rome south was called the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, which was yeah. southern Italian, southern Italy, and the island of Sicily, which is the poorer part of Italy, which Mo which provided most of the most of the Italian Americans you meet today probably from families from southern Italy because that was the yeah. poorer place. Let me get uh, we only have about what eight minutes I want to make sure I get to some of these other really wonderful comments and questions. There's this uh, person Lorette Folk says Vincent so good to see you in real time. I have two questions. One where did you get the idea of the egg in the pocket? Number two since you were basing uh, this book on historical characters, how did you navigate the writing of the book while honoring history and your own creative muse? Well, the egg is easy. Uh, when I, on our first trip to Sicily, I, we stayed there for around five or six weeks and we used to drink in this little, every afternoon we used to drink in this, it was a great life then. We used to drink in this bodega and there was a little guy, a guy named Vincenzo who would come in there and eat his egg. And he was an old fisherman. But uh -huh. he never died. So I just got that and I, I just linked that up to the story of the flying monk. Okay. And yeah, it just kind of, just kind of came together. Yeah. But I used to watch this guy, Vincenzo. He was an old fisherman. He used to come to this place. It was a, it was like a long tunnel-like place where you could drink wine and eat. eat Such fruit. a great detail. Yeah. And uh, he used to have an egg in his pocket and he had a knife. He would take the knife out and poke a hole in each end and then suck the really? egg and put no, the, it was a raw egg. egg. It was a raw egg. Yeah. Oh. And, and put, the, put the eggshell back in his pocket. Did it every day. So he, uh, there, uh, what's the the rest of the part? I don't know how I did it. I, I think Laurette, I think I did it by writing short chapters and making sure that the chapters relate, making sure that the trying to get the the, the characters and the chapters to relate to the larger theme, the yeah. larger picture of you know through the you detail. To, yeah, the the outer frame and the inner frame is really, yeah. Like, it's not. It took a long time. It's not. Yeah, you know, writing is like labor, laborious, as we all know. Here's a question from Alvino Fantini who says, any thoughts about the feasibility of publishing a series of short stories titled Italian Tales and Memories, Racconti uh, e uh, Ricordi Italian in bilingual edition in both Italian and English? Well, if you had a publisher who would be interested, I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't yeah. know about the possibilities. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. that, that's a publishing question that I, I wish I had a little more uh, heft, but I can't. <laughs> really. Yeah. Here's a here's a question from John Arena. Vincent, it's Sunny. Have you ever written a novel or short story of about your growing up in Mount Lodge Park and used those experiences you had? I actually wrote some very early stories about growing up there and going fishing and I that was no, that was it. I didn't after that I uh -huh. after that I went to the schoolyard. And now I've been trying to get out of the schoolyard for most of my life. <laughs> you wrote Disorderly Conduct in White River Junction. Disorderly Conduct was a novella that's part of a collection that's still waiting to be picked up by somebody. Um, titled yeah. Disorderly Conduct. Great. Which great. could be what Alvino was talking about, about a series of stories about Italians or Italian Americans. Uh huh. Yeah. Here's, have, here's your old friend from the Iowa Writers Workshop, Dan Gleason. What is the most compelling element in the Italian culture that produces rich stories? Oh God, I don't know. There, um, I think in the Italian culture, you have some of the, the great 
the, the great historical events. Number one, the Roman Empire that lasted for over 500 years. And then the number two is the Renaissance. Um, all were very, you know, all part of a, a Italian culture. And number three is just the, the, the unification of the country and the, the conflict between North and South, which is still going on. Um, it's kind of all, it, it makes for, I mean, I think I consider myself lucky that I'm part of, that I can identify with this culture. I, I feel like I'm an American writer, but with a, I know where I come from. I'm not an Italian writer, but I'm an American writer, but I know what's behind me. Yeah. And it's, it's those great forces there. And I mean, if you read, I read quite a bit of you know, history of the Mediterranean. Uh, Sicily was overrun by any, you know, the Carthaginians, the French, the Spanish, the Muslims. Um, mm -hmm. It makes for a very rich culture and it makes for a rich uh, language, which is constantly changing. And for all those mythical stories. Yeah, well, well, we the stories of the Cyclops. You could have, you know, started with any one of those traditions, but you actually start the story with uh, this conflict between the fasci and the nobility with Don Vito. Um, yeah. And the nobility, which you don't, you realize, well, that's not really the story I want to focus on, but it's the opening of the novel. Right. Well, if you, that's, the, the Sicily was, like a lot of Europe, was basically a few, under a feudal system. So the situation was that the, the landowners uh, hired land managers to basically exploit the peasants. Yeah. And every once in a while, the peasants would rise up and revolt and they would, conditions would be a little bit better. And maybe by now, you know, they got a little bit better, but they were con there was more than one uh, peasant revolt. And this particular one is incited by Don Vito Cascio Ferro, who's one of the character, main characters in the book. So I started from there. I mean, and this is, it's true that he came to this town and talked about, you know, these, these are ideas from the enlightenment. These, these ideas from the enlightenment that, about self-determination, about science, about logic, finally made their way down to Sicily. And that's where yeah, the book begins. It's absolutely fascinating because they, the immigrants carried all of that conflict of, you know, that, that occurred between the managers of the workforces or the, you know, the, of the, of the various, um, uh, just, uh, laborers uh, throughout Sicily uh, to New Orleans, to New, to New York, yeah. and um, which played a huge role, didn't it, in the kind of the, uh, the kind of labor practices that occurred in, in, a, in this country? Yeah, well, the Italians had to undergo a lot of the prejudice that happens to, nor to new groups of immigrants. It's a very pattern, that, pattern that's repeating itself. Uh, at the time in like the 1890s when Sicilians uh, came to New Orleans in great numbers, they began to dominate the fishing industry and the, the produce industry. There were also gangsters there. There was a famous murder of a police chief. Uh, 11, 11 Italian Americans who were innocent were lynched. Several Italian, uh, it, 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 there's an allusion to it in the book in when, when Santo was down south. But it's, um, it's, a, it's a vivid, yeah. Rich history. So Italians were involved in the, the great Lawrence strike in the 1920s. You have Sacco and Vanzetti and the, and the anarchists who, who were trying to change their society. So there's quite a bit of material, I think. Who, who assassinated McKinley. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, one, one minute or so left here. There's just one other person here. I came in late, missed your reading, but is any of the dialogue in Italian? And if so, how do you decide to handle uh, that and its artistic purpose. Well, um, I, I'll just say very briefly, there's, there's no actual dialogue in Italian, but the, the book is full of Italian terms. Um, uh, and, and of course, names, and, and that's some of which you uh, define in the novel, but others you don't, which is an interesting point. No, you try to get the Italian rhythms into the English. That's what I did, that's what I tried. I know there are several times where the per person says, listen to me. Well, if you talk in Italian with Italian, they'll say, it's to me. They say, listen to me. It's yeah. a kind of an Italian expression. So there were several times in the book when somebody says, listen to me. Yeah. That's Italian. But like the terms for, for knives or the terms for no, 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 no. the mouse. I'll tell you what I know. I'll tell you, when I wrote my Caesar book, I, Julius Caesar book, I made great efforts to eliminate almost all Latin words. I didn't want it to be distraction. Yeah. And so I don't have very many Italian words in this book because I want the book to read and I want the writing to flow. Yeah. Oh, well, I purposely minimize the use of Italian. But there are some. There are some. And oh, yeah, there are some. Yeah. It adds to the authenticity of the book. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, Vince, we're out of time. It's six o'clock. We are out of time. Yeah, yeah. you're silly. And uh, you've got. A, I should also mention you have a lot of kudos here. Thank you for the great reading many times here in the in the chat room. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. You're very welcome, all of you. It's an honor for me to be able to do this. It is, believe me. Thank, thank you, Vince okay. and Charge. An excellent presentation. Um, we're going to pop up a quick survey here. Just two questions. If people could answer um, about the fall festival, about whether or not you would be interested in attending a live festival or if you'd be interested in attending a virtual festival. Um, and uh, if you want you, to both. Or both, yeah. <laughs> if you could just answer those two really quickly and everybody okay. enjoy your weekend and, uh, and we will look forward to having you uh, next time. I don't have a date yet for the Danielle Trusani event, but it'll be sometime in the next three weeks probably. Um, so look out for the notice about that. It should be equally fascinating. Okay.